Born in Canada on July 14, 1922, to the father of Scottish origins, Bill Millens moved to Glasgow when he was three years old. Bill joined the Territorial Army in Fort Williams, where his family had moved and played with the Pipes Band of the Highland Light Infantry and the Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders before volunteering as a commando and training with Levatt at Arcanery. Millens is best remembered for playing the pipes while under fire during the D-Day landings in Normandy. Pipers had traditionally been used in battle by both the Irish and the Scottish. However, the British Army had restricted the use of bagpipes to the rear areas by the time of World War II. Levatt, nevertheless, ignored these regulations and ordered 21-year-old Private Millen to play, telling Millen's, Ah, but that's the English War Office. You and I are both Scottish, and so that doesn't apply. Millen played Highland Laddie, The Road to the Isles, and All the Blue Bonnets Over the Border, as his comrades fell all around him on Sword Beach. Millen states that he later talked to a captured German sniper who claimed he did not shoot at him because he thought he had gone mad. Millens was the only man during the landings to wear a kilt. It was the same kilt that his father had worn in Flanders during World War I. He was armed only with his bagpipes and a black knife sheathed inside the kilt on the right-hand side. presents the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast with your host, Dodd Abernathy, Jeff Kopsetta, and Henry Sledge. What's going on, everybody? It's another episode of the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast, your favorite World War II-based podcast. I want to change things up a little bit at the intro because it's not every day that you hear a modern-day punk song, if you will, about World War II and about one Billy Millens and his landing during D-Day with nothing but bagpipes and a knife. But joining us, as always, from Texas, Alabama, and our guest from Tennessee, Henry Sledge, Jeff Copsetta, and you may know him from War Stories podcast, Preston Stewart. Preston, how are you doing tonight, sir? Good well. Thanks so much for the invite, man. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. Henry, how are you guys doing? I'm, I'm doing good, man. I, was, I thought we had some Dropkick Murphys going on there for a minute. I was enjoying that. Very similar to Dropkick Murphy's. I've yet to discover a World War II based song. Yeah, probably, um, probably not. Probably not. There is, if you remember the keyboardist from Lincoln Park, he put out a little side project called Fort Minor, and he is of Japanese American descent. And I think one of the songs we'll cover in the future, he did a song about the Japanese internment camps that came out like in mid 2000s. And so uh, there's definitely uh, content out there that we can, we can talk about. But, um, as I said, joining us from the War Stories podcast, and I, I've discovered him on TikTok, Mr. Preston Stewart. Um, give us a little brief background on you, how you got into uh, military history. I know you graduated from West Point in 2009, but just to uh, let our audience know about you, uh, give us a little history on that. Yeah, grew up in uh, Champaign, Illinois, um, with, with my grandfather, who was in the Korean War on my mom's side, or in, in the Army during the period of the Korean War, so 1950s. And he had army stuff sitting around, so we just used to like to play with that. And he was big in the Civil War and always had great stories um, about military history. So just enjoyed that. Grew up watching the History Channel back when they were doing a lot of military history stuff. Back when they had uh, history. Yeah, it seems like it was a long time ago. But uh, that was the stuff I liked to watch. And then once I got out of college and, and could kind of choose the things I wanted to read, started reading more military history and just really enjoy it. It's, it's the thing that I choose to learn about now that I don't, you know, once you're done with school, you don't have to learn about anything. Um, that's the thing that I really like spending time doing. So um, a couple of years ago, started making content just as another way to learn more, have discussions like this right here and have the chance to interact with people who also have an interest in those topics. So started making short videos and that turned into a podcast and talk a little bit longer because a minute's not very long and and uh, yeah, has led to some awesome experiences like being on the podcast here and chatting with you guys. 
it's amazing how that works. Is um, I'm trying to get my daughter to read, and I was the same way in school. It's like I, I'm not interested in any of this nonsense. But once you start reading about things you enjoy, whether it's World War II or graphic novels or how to make Afghans, whatever it is, it just definitely makes everything so much more palatable. Yeah, for sure. Just whatever the thing is that that appeals to you, and I, I think that's kind of a challenge though because you don't have that choice until. <laughs> 18, 22, maybe later. Um, but yeah, finding that thing is important. You know, it's funny. I was in, I'm a pretty decent drawler, even having done it in a long time. And I remember when I got to high school and I joined art class, I was all excited until I realized art class, I had to draw what I was told to draw and how I was told to draw it and things like that, which it, it's like, how do you put regulation on someone's free form passion? I'm getting some feedback yeah, somewhere. I do apologize. Thing about, you know, I, I'm, I'm an artist myself. And it's funny you say that because art class was the same thing for me. You know, I actually had an opportunity to design a billboard for the Army recruiting uh, station at the town south of here. And but it was this is what we want. This is how we want it. And this is the timeline. And no, you, you got to feel like it. And it's the same thing even with with books. I mean, there's a subject that hits me and there could be another great book that I, I would love to read. But. That's it's got to wait till I'm in the mood for for that, you know, or that that particular campaign. I think Henry's kind of the same way. So yes, that's yeah, funny. We when you find a that. passion, run with it. Yeah. And I think all four of us, you know, we're, we all do podcasts. We all do about military history. I know Preston, you cover all ranges, you know. Whereas we here, we stick with World War II stuff, and you pretty much cover everything. But um, we kind of got into this a few episodes back, where we we're talking about how things are changing yeah. with. When it comes to publishing books, um, a lot of it is going to audio format and um, maybe digital format. And I've said before, um, in order to preserve history, I think it's super important that we keep it in, you know, at least our books in a hard copy format. But I think right now with the way people's attention spans are going and how they consume their information, I think what we do as far as audible format podcasting is all more important to help get that that message out there and to help educate people in the way in which they want to consume it. Yeah. I, I don't use TikTok to, to learn a lot of things when it comes to military history. There's yeah. little things I like for a minute here or there, but to me, 35 to 60 seconds is not usually what I'm looking for in those topics for maybe a quick recipe or something like that. Sure. But if that's how people are consuming information, then who am I to judge? Right. And, and I think, uh, I think similar with podcasts. Sure. You know, there was a time where people said, don't put it on the big screen. It's got to be radio. It's got to be in a book. And no, we need those documentaries. We need those movies. They're great. So I think you're spot on. If it's changing, it's changing. Um, just kind of be where the attention is. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to change things up a little bit. We had a, we had a um, living historian on here a while back who does a lot of um, patent impressions. And we all know how people talk about Patton, how he's kind of a, you know, he's a little rough around the edges. He kind of, a little bit of a maverick. He was a little standoffish, and we, we all know about that. But I was reading this book, and I was kind of surprised to hear a little bit about Chesty Puller that way. Henry, Jeff, have you guys really heard that much about Chesty Puller being that kind of, he had a little bit of that Patton-esque um, attitude to him? Well, you got to, know where I come from, man. I mean, my, my father was not a huge fan of Chester Puller. I mean, he was not in his battalion or later regiment, but, uh, you know, I think, and that goes back to the Peleliu action. But Well, and that's exactly what I'm reading, you know, Bill Ross's Peleliu, and I don't want yeah. to get too dug down into it, but this is the first, you know, of all the PTO-based stuff I've read, this is the first time I really heard this about Chesty Puller. And um, just here on page... 212. Um, let's see here. The feeling seamlessly is becoming more prevalent as seniors of the battle pass into and beyond their middle ages. In case in point, First Lieutenant Gordon I. Swanson from Minneapolis was a 23 year old frontline artillery spotter on Peleliu. He was assigned to the First Marines and thus a frequent personnel contact with the Colonel. Polar seemed to me, Swanson wrote in 1988, although I once called him an arrogant ass, that was most unexpected by the First Lieutenant to a Colonel. But it was a language which he understood and label which he wore with some pride. He always seemed to be uh, surrounded by more luck than good sense. 
his, ju his judgment was always questionable. When his book Marine came out off the press, he sent me one of the verse copies with a pleasant handwritten note and the flyleaf. I shall always treasure it. There will never be another chesty puller, an observation I make with a sense of gratefulness and relief. And it, it seems like people say that, especially on Pell Lou, that he was kind of, um, he kind of made some bad decisions that cost a lot of the, a lot of the Marines in the 1st Marine Division their lives, whereas some of the other colonels maybe in that position would have been a little more delicate in the battle plannings to try to um, minimize the, the, the uh, casualties. Well, he was being pressured from, I mean, you're, you're spot on, but that pressure was coming from above. Sorry, I'm trying to, uh, while you yeah, guys, the yeah, I'm trying to figure out where the feedback's coming from. Yeah, that's so distracting. Um, tell you what, guys, let's take a quick break. I'm going to pause this. Um, for those of you watching live, well, we'll just go with it. It's, I, I'm not sure where the, uh, the break is coming from. But, Jeff, you have a lot of experience with the PTO. Have you really heard that much about Pooler and kind of his his ability to just think on a dime and possibly put his guys into uh, needlessly um, dangerous situations? Yeah, I mean, we could all be, we could all be armchair quarterbacks here. I, I think just the thing to remember about any big personality like that is – uh, if Swanson's the lieutenant that's kind of always on the, the colonel's coattails or, or, you know, as a personal aide or, or, or things like that, or even just kind of reporting to him in, in, small, in, a, in a smaller environment, that lieutenant's not going to know every decision that, that Colonel Puller is having to make. He sure. doesn't understand a lot of the circumstances because guess what? It's not for him to know. Uh, he, he's going to be on a need to know basis. Uh, he's not, Puller's probably not going to want any feedback or pushback. This is it. This is why it is, or this is how it is. Don't ask why, you know. And not not that I'm saying I'm defending Puller. Yeah, I have heard those similar things, but you, I think you're going to tend to hear more of those things from probably people who were either one in Swanson's position or two, your general basic buck private that doesn't know anything that's going on, and you, you're going to, you know, gripes are, you know he's going to gripe it to the guy that's that's leading the guys into the foray so i don't know maybe, maybe preston can you know from your i was a non-commissioned officer so maybe from your officer's experience <laughs> what do you think you're spot on it's um we all can armchair quarterback at all the levels up but um yeah the lieutenant has no idea what a lieutenant colonel or colonel has to deal with and the other things at play um, we always think we do right we always think we know exactly the right answer and they're doing it wrong but in reality we never have that full picture. I'd be interested to know how much of this was felt at the time versus after. Because I think with, you know, Polar was, this is going to make it sound worse maybe than I mean it, but there's a decision made in, in the press at times to say, this is going to be our hero. This is going to be our guy. And I think Polar was that at the time, especially after Guadalcanal, he was kind of a, a hero of the Marine Corps. And I wonder if, if stories of him were spun in a way to maintain that image because the, the idea that his troops didn't like him or he wasn't, um, they didn't have as much confidence in him in the field. That's not prevalent. I, I'm not surprised at all that it's out there because nobody's going to have all top marks, but I wonder how much of it was overblown to kind of build up his persona or maybe not brought to the surface when it could be. Yeah. That's a good point. And I, I was, you said that, and I was looking through this book because they actually quoted, you know, kind of that was how the media personified Puller. You know, like, okay, he's kind of the patent of the PTO. We can give him this label. He's, he's our go-to guy. Um, he has that gung-ho spirit that we want the, the American people to, to think of when thinking of a Marine colonel. And I think you, you hit it precisely, and they're leading into that paragraph. There was a, a part in this book where they kind of made that comparison of, you know, he was just – the the media's go-to guy with trying to uh bolster the home front and to get people up and you know excited to buy war bonds and all that stuff and just that hollywood personification of what a marine would be to the people in america but yeah i was just you know i don't know i was just a little a little surprised when i, I came across that paragraph because i like i said i've read a lot of pto books and that was the the first real thing i came across you know, in, in your experience, 
hosting a po- How long has your uh, War Stories podcast been around, Preston? Started, um, let's see, going on two years ago, I think. About 18 months now, something like that. Right. And so, yeah, so you basically right around the beginning of uh, COVID is when you really dug into it heavily? Yeah, started in June of, uh, it was in June. So I guess it probably was June of 2020. Yeah. I was watching your, your recent stuff on TikTok, and, you know, it's always funny. People are like, what's D-Day stand for? And they're always so disappointed. Oh, it just stands for day or hour. And then, obviously, the one about the barrage balloons, which, you know, I never really thought about. Somebody asked you, well, how come they didn't use barrage balloons that much in a PTO, which I never really think about. Because when you see D-Day, you see them in Normandy. They're all over the damn place, but you rarely see them. And you you had an interesting aspect that for some reason the, the division that was kind of in charge of that they really weren't shipped out to the Pacific until near the end of forty five. But it wasn't new technology. Yeah, right? it wasn't some innovative thing. There's no re- I can't imagine the U.S. only had one battalion that did that. And you know a lot of times I'm fortunate that if I put out a question something like that, somebody in the comment section is a lot smarter than me. <laughs> in this case, at, at, you know as of now it's been eight hours or something, nobody has been able to provide a really good answer as to why there's like one or two cases of barrage balloons in the Pacific when there were dozens of landings. You know, I interviewed the art, uh, the archivist for the Goodyear Corporation, and I kind of just assumed that they probably helped provide that. No, <laughs> they were making uh, tank parts and all kinds of stuff, but I really thought sure. that he would, oh, yeah, we provided all the barrage balloons. No, not so much, but... You know, that's just one of those, and that's kind of the thing I find interesting about World War II and some of the stuff we try to bring on here. Um, before the show, I was talking to Jeff about how I had Jay Murray on, and we did a full episode on M1 helmets. Um, I had some of the historians over at the Springfield Armory site talking about how George Washington actually chose this site for the Springfield Armory and how they the, all their contributions throughout the history of the United States with the guns they developed. I've actually tried to reach out to Hershey Company, try to get somebody on here from Hershey to talk about their, their contribution to the war. And it's just those, those little things that we don't really think about that you never really see covered, as we said before, on History Channel back when they did history, that I find kind of piques people's interest because a lot of this stuff's been covered ad nauseum. And I try to find just the little things like, you know, the barrage balloons and this and that that, you know, aren't covered that much, but we're getting so far from that point in time that the people who could answer the question of why there was only one major battalion, they're getting harder and harder to find. Yeah, there's, there's so much content out there on this stuff. You know, the, the even a six-hour special on D-Day probably didn't cover the barrage. Yeah, yeah, there's so much other stuff to get into that there's all these little details that are missed that, you know, it, it doesn't, maybe the barrage, I don't know if it's a great example or not. Is it the most important part of history? Probably not, um, but it's it's there. It's interesting. It's unique, and there's there's just so many of those um, when you're talking about a global war for six plus years. Right? Well, it's something as simple as barrage balloon. Because I remember, God, probably about eight years ago, I was looking. I was like, "What the hell were those for? And what did they do?" And the army, being the army, and the whole aspect of keep it simple, stupid. Well, how do you prevent people from strafing our our uh, beaches and our ships? Well, you tie a three out cable to a balloon and you fly it over and and hopefully if they do attempt it you rip off a wing and it's like well that's simple and effective but it's it's those little things that you see something like that and like it's basic and kind of dumb but why why is that what's bothering me right now why does that make me want to run to google and do all the research on something that simple and i find it's the little things like that that might you know grab someone's attention and and make them do more research than they would on a normal day yeah, I was going to kind of tack on to that about, you know, the answer is probably in the question, what are barrage balloons for? Well, that's what they were for. And the reason they probably weren't used heavily in the Pacific is there just wasn't enough of a threat. I mean, just thinking about long before we made the first offensive, the fleet carriers were completely knocked out. So where's your next closest besides the aircraft that was stationed or trying to keep them down in the, in the Solomons? Where were some of the closest islands? There just wasn't enough numbers, I don't think. You know, I, I think from from what I've learned that the, the the only way the Pacific offensive was going to be successful is to have complete control of the sea and the air before we could ever touch the land. And, you know, that was what we were trying to do in Europe. 
And it took a little while. You know, those sub pens were pretty important that we kept plastering to no avail uh, in the early part of the bombing campaign. But, you know, eventually we whittled it down. Uh, we had to completely try to, you know, we had to take out the Luftwaffe so we could really start hitting places like Regensburg and Schweinfurt and Dresden and places like that. So it took time. Um, but in the Pacific, when it was so remote, the distances in between were, yeah, that aircraft may get here, but yeah. it get home. So, and without a carrier, uh, where is the threat from the air? And, and I think that was really taken into consideration uh, when, when most of the time, you know, before the offensive was drawn up. And, um, you know, just to think that the Army made about 50 D-Day invasions just in the Pacific Theater alone, 50 islands that nobody's ever heard of, you know, for the Japanese to cover that much airspace and then to be able to land and refuel again, I, I just don't see, to me, looking back, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I just don't see the need for battalions upon battalions of barrage bal balloon. I just don't see the threat there. And not that, but, and that makes perfect point. And plus, when you're traveling that far, in Europe, you had a short little trip over the English Channel. From here, as we all know, um, room on the ships for material. I mean, do you want 50 crates of barrage, barrage balloons or do you want extra crates of ammunition and uh, K ration? So <laughs> they probably said, eh, I don't think Louis the Louse and uh, Washington, uh, you know, the washing, <laughs> washing machine Charlie is going to be, you know, affected by these barrage balloons. So let's not waste <laughs> the space and uh, let's allocate some more room for food and uh, some boondockers and uh, maybe let's get some compression helmets down there because all the uh, holly liners are rotting away in the tropical sun. So maybe let's better <laughs> utilize our space. Yeah. That's my opinion. I don't know. I never dug into it enough. Preston, we talk on this podcast, um, especially when it comes to like uh, Henry, who's in the cold area. I'm down here in Florida. The weather never changes. It, it worse, it gets down to the 40s every once in a while. But he kind of talks about how with the change of the weather comes his um, desire or leaning towards the subject matter in which he he um, reads up on. I.e., in the winter time, he's more battle of the balls, more European theater. Where when it's hot outside, it's it's more PTO stuff. When it comes to planning for your show and um, or just the subject matter that grabs your interest at that particular time, how do you go about it? Are you swayed by just things you come across, or you just does it come to you in the middle of your sleep? Like, oh, what about that? Shotgun blast, man! I'm I'm listening to a book now um, called On Desperate Ground about the uh, Chosen Reservoir. Oh, okay. Right? So there's probably going to be a handful of stuff about. The Korean War right now, just because as you're going through it, you're like, that is an interesting little piece here or there. Um, a lot of it comes from comments, questions. Uh, I'll see people debating things that maybe sometimes if there's just a lot of debate back and forth, like, hey, that's something people are interested in. Let's talk about that. Um, other times I'll see people are, for whatever reason, not correct on something, but kind of hammering at home. Like, all right, well, there's something to talk about. Uh, that's definitely a video maybe a podcast when it comes to the podcast it's a lot more not opportunistic um but it's just when we when we find the right person we don't necessarily have a theme to those monthly or weekly we just uh we schedule people a couple months out and see what works and, and sort of like that but tiktok videos it's by the day that's a that's a big that's a huge commitment to keep those videos going to stay on the for you page and and just sticking with the algorithm, it's constantly changing. And with the content in which you do, it's like, well, there may be something you want to cover, but you know the community guidelines are like, no, we're not, we're not going down that rabbit hole. Because we just got off a of Facebook suspension. We, uh, we got our hands slapped because I had the audacity to post a picture of a guest who is a former Marine. He is a um, author. He reproduces German paperwork for Hollywood. He has a book on all about German paperwork. He is a, a graphic designer by trade. And I posted a picture on our What's the Scuttlebutt Facebook page, which is a group you have to join. It's a page entirely about World War II, but because he was in his SS officer's uh, uniform with the spot sticker on it, um, they dinged us and they buried our content and they uh, killed our live stream for 25 days. And so it's like, that's... It, and it's like, this is history. And that's... it's It's... It's sad and kind of scary the fact that when you're talking about history, you got to take, you got to keep that in the back of your mind. It's like, do I just say the hell with it and what happens happens, or do I want to censor history so that I don't upset the social media overlords? I don't think you have a choice, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, I think that's kind of the problem is that 
from experience on TikTok, I can't say Hitler. I can't say Nazi. Um, I've seen other people be able to do it, um, but I've gotten my hand slapped for that, so I'm just not going to try it again. I had, um, I had a video taken down for simply showing, I, 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 in my corner here, I, whatever impression I did at the last World War II event in order to air out my uniform because I don't wash them, I put them on a mannequin. I call Steve here in a podcast studio. And after a Marine Corps event, I just did a TikTok where I pulled my K bar out of the sheath, just so, showed the K bar logo and made and all, you know, where it was made and put it back in the sheath. That thing was up for a minute and a half before it was taken down for community guidelines. I wasn't pretending to stab anybody. I wasn't throwing it at my drywall. I literally just pulled it out of the sheath, showed the logo, slid it back in, and that's all it took. I don't know. I um, I think podcasts are generally looser. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. I think that's a positive. I haven't had any problems on YouTube. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's like Japan's Unit 731 deserves a lot of attention. Um. And it's the kind of thing where you can't tiptoe around that one. If you tiptoe around that unit, it loses all its meaning. It, it was so, you guys all know, it was so graphic and so inhumane that to say that they committed atrocities and move on is, is like barren. Yeah. So I don't know what the solution is. What? So um, you're currently reading a uh, the Korean War book. What was it called again? On Desperate Ground. On Desperate so Ground. So focused, focused in and around the Chosen Who's Ground. Who's the author on that? Hampton Sides. Hampton Sides. I'll have to look into that. Uh, Henry, this is be a good time to go into the part of our podcast where we're talking about the current books we're into. What project are you currently reading or getting into or wrapping up for that matter? I just uh, started Richard Frank's Tower Skulls. What's the um? I finished up Samuel Elliott Morrison's Volume Four, Coral Sea Midway and Sub Actions, and started Richard Frank's book. What's uh, and it's it is a history of the East, or history of the Asian Pacific War from 1937 to 1942, and it's it's going to be a trilogy. So this is Volume One. He's working on Volume Two. Okay, so this book just came out then. Yeah, well, mm, year year or two ago. It's fairly new. Gotcha, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so reading right now, um, Bomber Boy, well, you guys know my theme, come on, man. it's going to have to have a B-17 on the cover, you know, right now, but uh, yeah, Bomber Boys, really cool, it's it's actually um, kind of a, a, a novice author, uh, I think his brother is a little bit more uh, popular than, than, than Travis is, um, but came across uh, a guy that was his landlord that happened to be a, a navigator, and uh, I think the three, uh, 305th bomb group and got wrapped up in a little reunion. And right there at this little town in Connecticut, there was a half a dozen or so guys that had served in the mighty eighth and um, didn't necessarily know each other then, but kind of got together for kind of a mighty eighth breakfast, you know, once a month or something. And he got to pull four really uh, good stories from, from some of these guys, uh, their experiences. Um, so that's the book now. And, so if, if one of our former guests that I've been talking to almost daily, Mr. Leighton Hughes over there in the UK, uh, there's another book to add to your list, buddy. Um, and then as far as projects, uh, man, it really goes with the theme that we're talking about tonight with these little niches in history. Uh, and, and Don and, and Henry, you guys know, I kind of gave you a little news flash uh, from the latest uh, film fest over the weekend. Walking Point won best veteran themed film at our very last uh, film fest. We we're done on that circuit. That was a two and a half year ride. That was amazing. Almost three years now. Uh, but well, getting 20, wrapped up. 